So we uh, spent now some time digging into the relation of the polarization to its uh, response or to the corresponding response function and to the fields. And uh, the results that we have will enable us now to understand better the relation between the polarization or, or let's say the spatial dependence of the polarization. So we have P depending of course on R and time and the dependence, this dependence, the dependence on R originates from the electric field. So originates from E entirely. It entirely depends on the electric field. The thing is that the molecules interact uh, with the field individually. So molecules, molecules do not interact with each other. Uh, I'm not saying that there are no interactions between molecules that you have in your sample, but you have to have them really close to each other, in which case they are part of the same complex, the same basic system that we look at, the basic uh, system of uh, electronic levels. But these basic systems, virus dimers or, or photosynthetic antennae and etc., anything that you could put in these, uh, into these experiments, they don't talk to each other and therefore their state depends only on the external electric field. And as all the molecules virtually interact with the same field, they feel the, the only difference that they feel is the face of the electric uh, field that is coming to them. And that depends on their position. So that's the, that's the, that's the dependence. Otherwise we can write that, you know, if you remember one of our earlier uh, lectures, the signal electric field signal electric field ES obtained sort of at the end of the sample. So the fields propagate and the signal also propagates through the sample and then they leave the sample. So at the point where they leave the sample, this signal electric field has a different phase and it's multiplied by P and then there is a P uh, 3T third order um, response polarization. Uh, which depends on t, well, this is basically a function that does not depend on the, uh, on the spatial part of the field. We have already integrated over that. And from the integration, we obtained basically just the length, length of the path through the sample. So this is the length of the path. through the sample. Okay. And where the signal goes, actually this signal always goes into a direction of a combination of the K vectors of the incoming fields. If we have three of them, uh, we will, I mean, we are discussing a three pulse experiment and we might or might not have different K vectors, but in case we have, there are various possible combinations of the K vectors. And um, in all these directions, we know that a third order signal, uh, signal goes. And of course the P3T here, there are different contributions. What we mean here is somehow the polarization that has the correct phase factor, the phase factor into which, uh, which we uh, look. I mean, clearly, if you put, if you send three pulses from three different directions into a sample and you look what kind of light appears behind the sample, you get the three original beams passing through the sample. Plus, if you have enough uh, resolution and of, of the intensity, you will be able to see spots which correspond to the different combinations of K vector. Now, one of the basic geometries of this experiment, the three-part experiment, is a geometry in which we put 
the incoming fields into vertexes of a square. So I'm drawing a square. Uh, I'm looking at it somewhat from an angle. And through these vertexes, I'm sending three external fields, which all meet at a certain spot in the sample. So here is the spot, here is the sample. So it's supposed to be somewhere inside this sample. And we have, uh, well, here, three directions heading towards this, towards this spot. Uh, it's going to be here and here. I mean, my drawing is not very good, but they all should be of the same. Uh, all these distances are, are, are the same. So these three incoming fields are labeled with K vectors K1, K2, and K3. And the signal, the signal will come out in uh, the direction of the remaining vertex. Well, it actually will go here. This is the this is the K KS. Well, how is this possible, or how can one read this? The drawing here is supposed to be in space, but let's have a look at it from here, so that we would see uh, we would see this as as a, a real square. So we can redraw the square here. Let's assume that the k vectors are going now from your face inside into the into the screen and they are supposed to meet all here in the middle this is supposed to be the middle of the square at least from the point of view of of an eye that i draw here so that means that i can draw now the k vectors or actually the only thing that i see of the k vectors is their contribution in the plane of the screen and i will draw them starting from uh, the meeting point that is the, the way that i draw the, the ks so if you look at it the bottom right vertex is the one through which the k1 comes so k1 i will draw here from the middle and pointing uh, to the direction behind behind the sample. That's where it, it will at the end end up on some uh, on some detector. So this is K1. K2 comes from comes through the bottom left vertex. And if I draw it now from uh, this meeting point out, it will head towards the upper right vertex. So this is going to k2 and then in our drawing we have k3 going from the upper right vertex and if i draw it if i draw it from the meeting point out it will end up here in the bottom bottom uh, left vertex so this is k3 and now let's make or let's draw the combination our sort of beloved the most interesting signal contribution which is minus k1 plus k2 plus k3 how is that going to look like or where is where is this going to head well we can we take minus k1 that's here minus k1 plus k2 and minus k3 no, no no plus k3 so the signal signal is going to appear here in this bottom right place of this square of uh, that bottom right vertex that's exactly as i as i draw it because the signal actually or well it's, that's not the signal but let's say the local oscillator we will be using to mix with the uh, with the signal will go through through this vertex here the one that I draw up on uh, vertex of the uh, of the square will go through the meeting point and emerge towards this bottom right 
bottom right uh, vertex uh, sort of behind behind the sample. That's where I will put the detector to detect the signal going in Ks equal minus K1 plus K2 plus K3. So this is the situation. This is the situation where we have specific direction minus K1 plus K2 plus K3 and ordering of the pulses or ordering one two, three. So the one with K1 vector will go first, the one with K2 will go second, and one with K3 will go the third. So we have we have discussed different uh, different possible signals. So this was the case, this was the direction in which uh, we have seen uh, the rephasing uh, re -phasing signal to appear. We can also have a look where we would possibly see at the same time with the same ordering uh, the uh, non-rephasing signal. So I'll draw the, the same diagram again here in the middle. We have the same vectors K1, K2 and K3. And we notice that the non-rephasing signal goes into Ks equal K1 minus K2 plus K3. So let's follow this field. So that's K1. We've already we have already drawn that. We add minus K2 to this, minus K2, and we add K3. So it turns out we end up with the signal here outside the box, outside the square. But that's it's not it's not such a big deal. We simply have uh, to place the detector to a different to a different place. And if the ordering is so, ordering is still one, two, three. This will be the place to detect non-rephasing signal. From the discussion that we have done, it's also clear that we can detect the non-rephasing signal in the same place as the rephasing one if we exchange the ordering of the pulses uh, so that the K2 pulse comes first. Yeah? So it's now clear that uh, Either the geometry or ordering of the pulses gives us access to different parts of the nonlinear nonlinear response. I mean, right now, rephasing and non-rephasing is just a term for us. I mean, we will later look into the response functions to figure out if there is some re real interesting difference in the dynamics that we see there, and we will also learn uh, like how to combine these uh, different contributions in order to get a meaningful spectra. But for now, we actually don't really know what is non-rephasing and rephasing signal for. We will learn that later. The ordering of the pulses, as you can see, is, is something really important. But we still think in terms of perfect pulses, perfect, very narrow, never overlapping. When the pulses are overlapping, there is a, you know, we, we, we get an extra problem with all the problems that we might have in this experiment. There is an extra problem coming from ordering or false orderings of interactions in the measurement with finite pulses. So problems with ordering in finite pulses. It is a problem because look, if we take the time axis, take the zero and put the third pulse in it, K3, and then we put somewhere K2 and K1 and make them overlap. So this still means that we have a finite delays, for instance, the delay tau. 
and the delay t still perfectly finite and reasonable but you know remember that we are actually integrating over all the electric fields uh, and all the possible delays between them so for instance there are the following delays available so we interact at this point in the first pulse at this point at the second pulse and this point at the third pulse so then we have tau 1 delay tau 2 delay and if we measure the signal somewhere here at time t we have also a tau 3 delay so that's the point where we measure measure the signal but look there are also the following possibilities giving some sort of a signal and uh, we see if this is the time t here we see, we see that there is there are basically no significant differences i mean the signals from different orderings are not forbidden they just have different face uh, face characteristics so let me draw the pulses so the pulses will be the same it's still the same situation i mean i didn't manage really to make the overlap the same but doesn't matter you can imagine that the overlaps are really the same and now let's imagine that the first interaction is coming with the second pulse and the second interaction is coming with the first pulse so there is a small but finite tau one which is actually a minus tau one and then there is well imagine that there is this the same interval here time two and and tau three going to t but here here we have some i mean we can call it wrong but well it's a bit unusual ordering of interaction wrong ordering of interactions because we um, integrate over all possible delays and po all possible orderings also of the electric fields in the integral where, which gives us the polarization we inevitably also have contributions in which the pulse with k2 comes earlier than the pulse with k with k1 and that means that although we may have the tau and capital T exactly the same it's the same situation and we are measuring at the same time T we have contributions not only from the rephasing pathway as pathways as we would expect because we have the ordering of the pulses k1 goes first k2 second k3 third but we also have contributions from non-rephasing pathways which uh, sort of properly belong to a different ordering of the pulses so this is nothing strange but it means that we do not have such a strictly separated types of signals as we would expect in uh, really very very small pulses so while this you you would you would think well okay then let me measure uh, let me measure with tau such that there is no overlap the problem is they said this is not possible so this problem occurs when uh, well spectroscopic technique and we will see that the spectroscope some the spectroscopic techniques really dictate that we have to scan over different values of tau uh, when spectroscopic technique requires scanning of tau also including the region tau is similar to zero yeah, these things these things uh, happen so to close the discussion here uh, the fact that the pulses are finite that is that they have finite uh, length means that they also have finite width so the finite finite pulses there's always a relation between their uh, extent in time delta t and their extent in frequency 
delta omega and because they are not infinitely sharp they are not infinitely broad and that leads to distortion of the spectrum so we have distortions of the spectrum just by the fact that the, we do not cover the spectrum with enough bandwidth so you can imagine that we have we have a situation in which the molecule has peaks somewhere so this is the spectrum and we cover it with uh, a pulse which is not perfectly perfectly covering it so this is the spectrum pulse spectrum for instance it's clear that we cannot measure with this single pulse an absorption outside the bandwidth of the uh, of the spectrum so this sort of leads to distortions of the spectrum and uh, yeah on the other hand we can clearly correct for that so whenever we have enough bandwidth or at least a little bit of amplitude there we can always correct for the problem by uh, by normalizing to uh, the loss of uh, of bandwidth but the problems that we encounter when we have false ordering they cannot unfortunately be be corrected uh, like this so band with the band with problem can be corrected however pulse ordering problem cannot be corrected we just have to assume or hope that this is not going to spoil the picture that we uh, get from the spectroscopy uh, entirely i mean here it's true uh, that you know as we as the pulses get shorter the problems get smaller but for the situations in which uh, more than one pulse or more than two pulses overlap this starts to be forbidding and in some spectroscopies we therefore have to exclude certain parts of what theoretically could be a legitimate uh, legitimate spectrum we uh, already know how to calculate uh, nonlinear signals going in selected directions in a three pulse experiment that was basically the content of the lecture up to now however to convert this information into meaningful spectroscopic techniques of higher than first order uh, in our case of course the third order we need to be able to interpret what uh, what we have calculated or what the signals actually mean in terms of some other already known quantities so in the present we will try to uh, establish a relation between those signals represented by uh, Liouville pathways because the Liouville pathways are basically uh, components of the nonlinear response that is we want to establish connection between those uh, signals and the absorption spectrum or absorption line shapes as we know them from linear spectroscopies so we will still keep working with a two-level system which has a ground state and an excited state And we know that a two-level system like this will exhibit absorption spectrum around the energy of or the frequency of the transition between the ground and excited state and that absorption spectrum will look like a peak around around this central frequency uh, the, this, the, the width of the peak comes from uh, various processes for instance the lifetime of the excited state or dephasing occurring due to the interaction of this two-level system with its environment and so far we have discussed absorption spectrum absorption spectrum being basically some sort of a effect of the first order response of the system and we have been able to write it down 
in terms of some known quantities, frequency, refraction index, uh, speed of light, and linear susceptibility, namely its imaginary part. This is imaginary part of the linear susceptibility. When discussing the role of susceptibility in spectroscopy, we've been basically starting with first order polarization. First order polarization is a function of time and space. We've actually uh, worked with the time dependent, uh, time dependent polarization stripped of the spatial factor because the spatial factor is basically just uh, copying the plane wave of the field that we sent into the sample as a probe. That's the field by which we measure. And we can use the fact that in frequency domain, that is after Fourier transforming the polarization, getting to the frequency dependent polarization, we can write the following relation, namely that the linear susceptibility is mediating the relation between the external electric field and the polarization itself. The, the linearity of the polarization, the fact that we write this uh, tiny one here, that means that this is linear. The linearity is in that, that there is only a single occurrence of the electric field E here. So this is how it looks in frequency domain. And going back to expressing the same thing in the time domain, we get P1T equals epsilon zero. And here a convolution, this is a well-known rule that convolution of two functions, in this case, it's S1 of tau and the E of T minus tau. This integral is a convolution that this is represented in frequency domain by a product of the uh, Fourier pictures. That is E T goes into E omega and S1 T goes into chi, chi omega. In, in this definition. And the function S is actually a tensor in this case. The, the function S is a first order response. First order response function S1 of T that is defined. Now that we know the third order, there will be no surprise in how the first order looks like. This is basically how, how the first order linear response function looks like. We can write it so that we express the V super operator here by means of the mu that is transition dipole moment operator. So this is just two contributions here. Here we have the evolution super, super operator acting on mu minus rho and here we would have minus rho mu and we have to put this bracket here because the super operator acts on both of these both of these terms now we can take out the uh, transition dipole moments so we will have d square and trace of the operator M, which is basically just the projection from ground to the excited state, and minus trace M tau, and here, here we have rho minus, and the M operator acts from the, from the right hand side. Okay, so this is uh, how we decomposed the first order response function into some sort of first order Liouville pathways. So these are first order Liouville pathways. So now it should be clear that in any order 
of response, we can always write some sort of Liouville pathways of the, con of the corresponding order. In the third order, if you remember, we had three actions of the uh, transition dipole moment from left or right, right hand side of the diagram and it was all closed by one action of the transition dipole moment from the left and that left or right action was actually arbitrary because under the trace you can put the last m the last from the um, if you if you follow from the right hand side so the last one can be put on the very left or the very right of the of the expression without changing its its result so in the first order we have a very short short double-sided Feynman diagrams for instance in the case uh, that we have the action of the transition dipole moment from the left on the initial uh, density matrix that is here we would have a Feynman diagram double-sided Feynman diagram that looks like this we start again from GG. This starting condition is uh, basically determined by the fact that we talk about optical transitions which are almost in all cases much larger energetically than KBT. So we can be sure that there is only the ground state uh, populated initially. And in the Liouville pathways that we follow here, we have first the action of M from the left which gives gives us e g and then we close it by acting with m from the left hand side again that puts us back to g and if you put a trace on this uh, clearly this will be uh, this will give a non zero uh, result and the most important thing about feynman diagrams are phase factors there is a phase factor here in uh, during the one interval of the of the response here which is the time tau and in that time tau the evolution the u0 super operator acts basically as an evolution of an optical coherence with a phase factor e to the power of minus i omega e g tau so this is how how we can how we can obtain um, this is basically how we can uh, write a diagram for each of these two Liouville pathways. We also know that the other Liouville pathway will be complex conjugated. So, so there will be, there will be a, the same start and complex conjugation means that we act first from the left, that's uh, from the right hand side. That's actually what we do here. Then we evolve uh, for the time tau again. So we get to E g and then there is an action of the transition dipole moment from the left but as i said it can be easily and equivalently written to the right so that the diagram truly is just a complex conjugated term i mean in some literature these pathways are denoted as j1 because of the the one is uh, the first order so this is the Liouville pathway will be J1 and here J1 star. All right, now let us therefore continue writing uh, the response here, or let's uh, let's move uh, to the uh, to the Fourier transform. We want to write out an expression for the imaginary part of the susceptibility in frequency domain. So this is going to be the Im imaginary part of the Fourier transform of the response function. So this is the Fourier transform. We uh, will also use the fact that, well, the, the response function is defined only for positive, uh, for positive taus. So this can equivalently be written as integral from zero to infinity d tau and let us now write directly the the response functions that is there will be i divided by h bar d square 
and here we will have j1 tau minus j1 tau star and this is multiplied by e to the power of i omega tau so why is there minus uh, the uh, pathway the, the 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 complex conjugated pathway has one action from the from the right hand side i mean the wavy line does not change the sign because it can be written equivalently on left or right that's not coming from a commutator but the first action is coming from the uh, commutator and every action from the right hand side has to be accompanied by a minus sign we also see the minus sign already here okay so this is the expression that we want to analyze now uh, looking into the actually also being inspired with what we have done before we we can realize that uh, whatever time evolution of this trace or of the evolution operator here will be it will contain the phase factor e to the power of minus i omega e g or the complex conjugated one and then the rest of it will be some sort of a slow evolution at least with respect to the optical frequencies so we will have imaginary part integral from zero to infinity d tau and we can write i divided by h bar some sort of a j1 tilde the slow evolving part e to the power of minus i omega e g tau and only this thing is going to be then Fourier transformed and minus integral the same kind j1 tilde star e to the power of i omega e g tau e to the power of i omega tau and closed now we can already see that the j tilde is relatively slow so most of the time dynamics is the phase factor here e to the power of minus i omega e g tau and these two guys they as they meet they cancel around omega equals omega e g whereas this phase factor here does not cancel and always oscillate with basically double the frequency of the transition so this integral will lead to basically nothing and will be equal almost equal to zero whereas the other frequency will yield a meaningful response i mean meaningful in meaning non-zero so it's going to be imaginary part of the integral we can go back to to this there is one over h bar i over h bar j1 tau e to the power of i omega tau and this can be written as a real part of d square integral using now there can be we can put here the h bar and here is the trace over the m operator u0 tam tau and i have to continue below here m rho minus infinity closing the trace and e to the power of i omega tau so this is now our expression for the imaginary part of the linear susceptibility that is the expression for the absorption coefficient okay we can write uh, using a model that we have developed earlier we can write some some uh, more answers here we can we can write the square h bar and we keep the real part out of the integral and here inside we know how this looks like we've been already talking about it m is always a transition from the ground state to the excited state plus the opposite transition and as it starts from the ground state uh, it first creates sort of a coherence element of the density matrix so we will have an evolution the superoperator will evolve 
the operate the, the, the element E G of the reduced density matrix. And because of the secular approximation, we still keep working in the states in which or in the basis of states in which the uh, secular approximation meaningfully works. So this element goes only into the same element and therefore we expect this to be the element of the evolution superoperator of the system that contributes basically the only element that contributes in here in this uh, integral. So this is the whole thing that pops up from the trace that we have here. Uh, I should also remind you that in case of the risp nonlinear response functions the th of the third order, we had a row of three superoperator elements with different time delays here. We have here only one time delay and one element of the reduced uh, density matrix superoperator. And of course, we have to continue here. We multiply with e to the power i omega tau, which makes the Fourier transform. And now we should also remember what we have said about, uh, about this element. We expect it to look like e to the power of minus i omega e g tau, this idea we've already used, but minus gamma e g tau, where gamma e g is some dephasing rate of the coherence E g. Putting this into our expressions, we get d square divided by h bar real part of the following simple integral. Plus i omega tau. And that's an integral that we can easily calculate and take a real part from. So we get d squared divided by h bar, real part of 1 over minus i omega e g minus gamma plus i omega. This will be multiplied by the same exponential at times infinity, which gives 0 because of the uh, gamma being positive and at zero it gives one which comes with minus so this is what we what we get here as a result this is a real part of one over gamma eg minus i omega eg minus omega this can be extended by gamma eg plus i omega minus minus omega eg we multiply divided by the same. So this is an ex expression which doesn't change anything except that we can now write our result in a better way. There's a real part and then we have gamma e g plus i omega minus omega e g divided by gamma e g square plus omega minus omega e g square and this is the real part of it means that everything with i will go away this gives us the line shape of the transition this is the lorentz so-called lorentz line shape Lorentz line shape because when we take the definition of the absorption coefficient we uh, need the imaginary part of the uh, of the chi here which we have just derived to look like this specific line shape we will um, we will make a definition here we will say that there, there will be several definitions that we will introduce now that the imaginary part of the linear susceptibility is in this case something like d squared divided by h bar multiplied by some sort of a line shape or function representing representing line shape i don't want to say line shape function because that's the name reserved for something else which we will introduce later so this is line shape this particular line shape we need to discuss a little bit 
you can uh, write it down. It's a function of omega centered at the frequency omega eg, and it's something that has some specific measures. So for instance, in this particular case, the height of this unnormalized line shape is one over gamma, and at the half width of this, at the half of the height is 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 exactly gamma so this is the this is this is the uh, the width of uh, of gamma this is the lorentz lorentz line shape uh, which is not very re realistic but for now as we want to keep things simple we um uh, we will keep working mostly with lorentz uh, line shapes now the most important thing here is uh, that we want to translate this information about spectroscopic meaning of the Liouville pathway, of the simple Liouville pathway. We want to translate this into uh, what we know about uh, the nonlinear response functions. So let's study a little bit what we have here for what kind of information we can distill from this or what's the properties of the line shape and where where we can find it. That's basically the most important question. What are the properties of the line shape? How to define it better, more meaningfully? And how is this related to the nonlinear response functions? For our purposes, it will be helpful now to introduce a function which we will call g, g of omega, and this function will be an integral over time from zero to infinity of actually any coherence element of the evolution superoper superoperator. So for instance, like this, it's going to be a Fourier transform or half Fourier transform of, uh, of this. This function is related to the line shape that we've defined uh, above, basically, the line shape that we have defined is a real part of the same function of the function that we've defined here. That's uh, the relation to the actual line shape. Um, and as you see, we've defined this function as a complex one. This is obviously a, a complex, uh, complex function. That will become very useful later uh, because due to the fact that the real part of this function is related to absorption that's what we have also shown the g tilde is actually related to the absorption spectrum uh, we will be able to construct some sort of absorption spectra also out of the non-linear uh, responses okay so what we can say now is that uh, for instance, the absorption spectrum will be proportional to the real part of this line shape function that we have defined. Now, we will not work only uh, with one level in uh, the models that we will treat. Uh, we will work with, uh, uh, with many levels. Uh, so we would need somewhat better description of the line shape. So we will also always add uh, the two states uh, of the transition which uh, this line shape describes. So for instance, in this case, it's the transition from G to E, and obviously a, an absorption spectrum would then be a sum over all possible spectra from individual transitions from the ground state to, the, to, to all available excited states. So this absorption spectrum defined like this would basically describe transitions from some state G to many different levels N and such an absorption spectrum would then look like something possibly with more than one, more than one peak. Okay, so this is still talking about absorption spectrum, but um, we should not we should not forget 
that we are actually aiming at nonlinear response functions at the and the Liouville pathways of higher order than the first. We take one Liouville pathway as an example. We will take the one that we called R2 before. So this is a Liouville pathway starting from GG with the first action on the right hand side, DG, second action from the left hand side, then again right hand side, and that's and that's it. So this is uh, a contribution to the nonlinear response, uh, or let's say to the electric field that comes out of the sample in a specific direction. This is a rephasing pathway, actually. So we can measure it in the direction minus k1 plus k2 plus k3 in the experiment that we discussed. And if we assume that this is all done with ultra short pulses, we can directly assign the electric field to the response functions and those response functions will depend on three delays tau capital t and t which are the first one is the delay between the first and second pulse second and third pulse are have a delay capital t and then th then we have actual actual time running after the third pulse which is which is the t and now this may, might have said that but this is the response function r2 which depends on t and two parameters capital t and tau this is basically up to maybe um, some prefactors uh, giving the signal electric field as a function of t and again as a parameter as a function of parameters capital T and T. And uh, the response function R2 is constructed out of the elements of the evolution superoperator. And if we go again from bottom up, which means from the right to the left, uh, in the way that we usually write it, we start with the element of the superoperator uh, UGEGE. Then comes E E E E, and then comes E G E G, and the dependence is from the right to the left tau capital T and and T, uh, which corresponds to going from bottom up uh, in the diagram. So now, if we imagine that we, for instance, detect this electric field as a function of T in some spectrometer so we don't actually detect it as a function of t but rather as a function of frequency we will detect a fourier transform of this so we are going to actually de detect something that um, looks like our line shape we have u e g e g t through fourier transform we get the line shape g omega e g and for the UGEGE, -E, if we take it as a function of T, we have it function of tau, but uh, we will need to define a line shape like this by the Fourier transform, because this is a Hermite conjugated element to the UEGEG, -E -G, we are going to get complex conjugated line shape EG omega. So this information will be later later very important. It's uh, th then important to say that except of that besides the definition that we have here, we can of course also show that when we change GE, uh, we will get a Fourier transform that is possibly complex conjugated or in another way, let's let's uh, properly discuss this. In fact, the Fourier transform that we will use here will be the one with minus frequency for reasons that will become apparent later in this uh, in this uh, lecture. So, for instance, we can say this is not really a definition, but this is what we can say and prove because it's nothing uh, else than uh, simple mathematics used 
this is in fact the g n g star omega basically precisely for the reason that u g n g n t is u n g n g complex conjugated and of course we used here uh, a different sign of frequency in the definition so we will be later on in this lecture actually needing this relation and and this relation in the green by which we defined uh, the line shape function no no line shape for the transition from uh, the state uh, ground state g to a state to a state e all right now um, an important thing here is the way that we detect uh, the electric field nonlinear electric field in our experiments we do that we do that by the so-called uh, heterodyne detection scheme so the signal field signal field es may be detected detected by heterodyne detection method that's because it is background free or it may be background free that's the electric field es which is the signal that we produced by sending three pulses from different direction can go in a direction which is different from the directions of the three of, of all the three pulses so uh, the situation that we have is that the total field leaving our sample is the signal electric field mixed with something that we call a local oscillator and that is providing a reference actually so this is the so-called local oscillator we detect the spectrally resolved intensity of light so we actually detect e of omega square so if we we know obviously that e omega is the local oscillator which is a field that we that we know that we sent in together with the signal into our detectors plus the signal field Fourier transformed here we should not forget that this still has the dependence on capital T and tau which are not running times but are delays between pulses so we detect something like this and if we make e omega square out of it we will get the e local oscillator square plus e s square plus two real parts e local oscillator with star and e s omega now the the first term that we have here the local oscillator is something that we know we can subtract it there is a second term which uh, we can assume to be to be small so we cancel it or we we ignore it and we have the third te term which is the one that we that we actually uh, actually detect now of course we can you know doing doing it this way we can ask ourselves what is it that we actually detect or what is the thing that we are able to read out of this so we can for instance assume that we can write the local oscillator in terms of an amplitude and phase so there will be amplitude and some sort of a phase depending on omega also and if we want to isolate es omega out of this this uh, out of what we what we have here the two real parts the best that we could do the best detection that we can do is to basically divide the 
amplitude out, only the amplitude. So we can construct the two real parts ds divided by the amplitude. Well, we know the amplitude square, so we can take a square root of it, which actually gives us only two real parts of the phase of the local oscillator and the electric field. So we can detect the real part of the electric field and that name up to the phase of the local oscillator. So the phase of the local oscillator is important. That phase factor cannot be removed in any simple way. And the only way that we will find later how to deal with it would be to find some sort of a reference for what kind of phase factor we should remove or what kind of phase factor we should assume to be the correct one in order so that a detection, heterodyne detection of the signal field gives us relevant information. We are not necessarily really after the all of the all characterization of the signal field. We need the relevant information, which may be, for instance, the information related somehow to the uh, to those uh, line shapes that we have. And that brings us to a very important question. What is actually this uh, line shape? What, what is, for instance, the uncertainty in phase in the detection doing to thing like absorption line shape? So the question is, what is the influence of the phase uncertainty on detection of a line shape? Why I'm actually even asking this? Well, remember that our signal field depends on these three times. Now let's imagine that T is equal to zero and tau is equal to zero. That means the U E E is equal to one and U G E is equal to one. And our electric field is then proportional just to this last, I write it explicitly at least once, it's proportional to this last evolution operator that comes into our response function, namely to u e g e g of t. So this is what, this is what we have. If we take a Fourier transform of this, so we take a Fourier transform and get to the G E G of Omega, then if I assume that E S of T is like U E G E G, then the G E of Omega is basically like E S of Omega. And I will not write the rest of the arguments because they are equal to zero. So this is this is what we have. And if we then take the real part of G E G omega, which is basically like taking a real part of the Fourier transform of the electric field, we see that this is proportional to absorption. So you can now now this is this is actually quite important here. If we go back in our argument to what we detect in the heterodyne detection, we actually detect the real part of Fourier transform of the electric field, but up to a phase. So let's have a look what what this does. That's how I can motivate motivate the the question that we that we started with. 
and let's then assume that we have absorption in quotations which depends on a phase factor which will basically be just the real part of the of some simple phase dependence there will be no dependence on omega for instance and here is the Fourier transform eg egt e to the power of i omega i omega t i mean i'm saying fourier transform but in order for this to be a real fourier transform we would have to have a, have to add a jump function in front of u but uh, you know in that case we could write it as a full fourier transform otherwise it's actually a half fourier transform so this is real part again of e to the power of i phi and here we can integrate uh, our model for for u e g e g which is e to the power of, min of minus gamma t where gamma gamma is some some uh, dephasing constant minus i omega e g t and here we have the e to the power of i omega t this is relatively simple to integrate so i'll just write the result this will be gamma minus i omega e g minus omega divided by g square plus omega e g minus omega square so this is the complex lorentz line shape and we know quite well from our earlier calculations that when uh, when phi the phase will be zero then uh, the line shape will be the one that we know already very simple Lorentzian line shape one but when phi is not equal zero we can because we will multiply everything by i omega we will get a cosine of phi to the re real part and we get a sine of phi from the imaginary part something like this and we will divide by the very same function as before so we can see that now the actual line shape looks completely different so here we have a normal line shape centered at omega eg but there are, there are two contributions uh, here basically one of them with cosine phi is the correct one the one that we find also in the standard situation with phi equals zero but uh, there is a contribution of a function which has a knot at omega equals omega eg so that's a function which has a line shape like this when the phase is not zero we have a combination of a normal absorptive line shape and of a, what basically is, a, is some sort of a refractive uh, line shape so the phase of the local oscillator or phase of the field with which our signal gets mixed in order to be detected it detected is extremely important and it needs to be somehow fixed so that in our measurement we are looking at the correct absorptive line shapes so the question that we will have from now on will be how to actually detect in the heterodyne detection in a correct way how to detect absorptive line shapes in heterodyne detection that's a very important question And to its answer, we will have to do two things. First, we find one place where some sort of a heterodyne detection occurs and works well. So the phase is automatically equal, uh, equal to, to zero in, in, in that definition. And then we will have to find another way how to, how to realize this 
in different places than just in the situation which we which we will discuss in order to to understand what where we are heading we will now reformulate uh, the absorption experiment absorption linear absorption experiment in form of homodyne detection so homodyne detection homodyne detection is the same as heterodyne detection but now the field that we mix with is somehow automatically already present in the experiment i will specify that later but it's done in such a way that we don't need to interfere and add a local oscillator by hand so homodyne detection in linear absorption linear absorption okay so we know we know uh, that when we measure absorption we send we send intensity some standardized intensity i0 uh, we send it through the sample and there is an intensity i uh, going out and then if we make their uh, ratio we get from the lambert bear law uh, a relation which defines the absorption coefficient so we can isolate roughly the absorption co coefficient in the following way we define some delta i which is i minus i zero then we take delta i divided by i which gives us roughly e to the power of minus alpha h minus one which is basically when the absorption is small minus alpha h now this we used already in a this in a completely phenomenological discussion of absorption using uh, the wave equations for electric field so if we take it again in this form so this is the now the um, wave function but with the linear linear polarization on the right hand side and we assume that everything is going in one direction so whatever signal we have here goes in the same direction as the as the field as the field itself so we can basically get rid of everything in here uh, we will assume that's of course an assumption but uh, an assumption that can always uh, be always be done that the electric field total electric field which goes through the sample con consists of the electric field that we sent in plus some modification to it plus basically the signal field now we know that the e0 satisfies the equation without the right hand side because this is the free field that we sent in and it must satisfy the left hand side of the equation equals uh, zero so the only thing that is then left after this ansatz in the equation so if we take these two things together is the equation which contains only the es and the right hand side but you know we have had already an equation like this before and it was an equation for our signal based on the non-linear signal at that case we ignored absorption and the first order field that always has to be on the right hand side entered this place here it, it actually entered as a uh, refraction index but we don't need the refraction index now we only we will basically leave the equations uh, in a form that we have already 
discussed for the non-linear generation of a non-linear signal, but now we generate a linear signal. The linear signal, therefore, has to have exactly the same form as we have seen before at the non-linear signal, that is, that ES will be basically, and again, well, we do it sort of approximately, uh, it will be I omega and now the first order polarization and H. So altogether, the total electric field that goes now out of the out of the uh, sample is the original field plus some constant that that I will denote kappa because we have only approximate a relation here for the ES plus the ES in a form of of this so we have the length length of the sample of the path through the sample and some and some pre-constant as basically the only additional things to the polarization multiplied by a phase and and uh, the, the frequency so now now we construct the i we are you know remember that we are still in the absorption experiment so we've sent in i0 okay i0 is e0 of omega square and now we construct the i which is i0 omega square from the first term it's kappa square h square omega square p1 t p1 omega square but this is something that we can ignore it's going to be very small and we have plus two real parts of the e0 omega and now all the uh, all the all the other terms that we see we see here so kappa i omega h and p of omega i'm ignoring at the moment actually all the vectors because they don't play they don't play any role now the delta e delta e is e minus e zero so this will be if we ignore the very small term with kappa square and h square it's the two real parts of e zero omega kappa i omega p omega h now we also remember that this actually equals to minus to minus alpha h that means that the absorption alpha of omega is and again we have to say that it's proportional we will ignore the kappa now it's proportional to imaginary part we have to take care of the i here so we have real part of i divided by a complex number so that is real part of i alpha uh, i a minus b so it's minus b so alpha is minus this and this thing contains minus so there will be plus imaginary part of omega e0 star of omega p omega okay that's not all we can go even farther alpha omega is therefore proportional to imaginary part of omega e0 star omega and here here we can write chi omega 
electric field zero omega because that's the field that has induced the first order polarization. So the first order polarization is induced by E zero. Now by writing alpha omega divided by intensity, which is actually the delta E divided by E. All right, we have we should have actually done that already. So it should be here. E zero. E zero. That is minus alpha H. So here we should have the E zero. And again, E zero should be already here and here. Hopefully this is not too much. So that means this is alpha omega. This is one over H. All right, alpha omega. And now this is proportional to imaginary part of omega E zero chi omega E zero omega. And here we have E zero omega E zero. That's the, the E zero roughly. I zero, sorry, I zero. And this can all be kept out and we get just the imaginary part of chi of omega multiplied by by omega. That's uh, a ver well known result that we already had had before. So this is a well known well known result which we have got from the idea that the absorption experiment works basically like the self heterodyne detection or in other words the homodyne detection the homo means here that is uh, that we are mixing the signal with the same field that induced it and surprisingly well or maybe not very surprisingly this type of detection this type of heterodyne detection which is called homodyne detection does not have a problem with the phase so there is no problem of phase in absorption experiment. And we will hopefully be able to use this when defining uh, a correct way of detecting our fields in uh, nonlinear spectroscopy. You know, in the absorption, it was clear, but what about defining some sort of a higher order absorption in which we could use the same natural definition of the phase that occurs in this homodyne detection scheme. And that's what we will do in the following.